Bibles, will you please, this morning to 2 Peter, the first chapter. Go all the way back to the back of your Bible. Revelation, then you're going to go through 1st, 3rd, 2nd, and 1st John. Then you're going to get into 2 Peter. It's a small book with powerful words in it. As you're turning there, as you're turning there, this morning's sermon goes along with VBS, gear up for life's big game. Gearing up for life's big game from Vacation Bible School this morning. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you guys know I'm a coach, I'm a tennis coach. I've been doing that for a long, long time. And uh, uh, we've had a lot of success uh, in the program because uh, we have great kids. But one thing that I really work hard on is, is, uh, is as I game plan. We put together a, a plan of action. Uh, you see, I uh, always look at my district opponents whenever we play them uh, throughout the beginning of the season, and then I learn their tendencies that, that they have. And so I put together a game plan, so when it comes time to our district time and our district tournament, there's nothing new that my players have not seen or heard from before. As a matter of fact, they have a game plan on, on how to defeat their opponent. And they all have individual game plans. Now, when I give them that game plan, it's up to them to execute it. If they don't execute it, they struggle, could even lose in the, the, the match. What about as that relates to us as Christians? You see, God has given us a game plan. God has told us the game plan. He, he tells us what to do. Uh, the Great Commission is what he's told us to do. You know, I was amazed at, at the conferences last week that I went through there, and uh, um, and I don't want to get the, the numbers mixed up. Carolyn, you might be able to help me on this. That there was only, it was like 20% or so of those of Southern Baptists in the church, Southern Baptist churches, knew exactly what the Great Commission was and what it actually meant to us. I'm proud to say that Bethel Baptist Church, hopefully you all know what the Great Commission is. Uh, uh, we talk about it all the time. Uh, if you don't, please ask me after service. And I'll explain everything to you on that. But we go over it over and over and over again. We have given, been given a game plan by God. Now it's up to us, us to execute that. Execute that in our lives and execute that in the lives of others. We're going to read about that this morning. Second Peter, this morning. Second Peter, the, the first chapter. We're going to see right off the bat some things that take place. Some powerful things that has happened here in Scripture. You see, change and transformation in the Christian life are fueled by the combination of human responsibility and defined power. Jesus Christ in the New Testament and the Old Testament scriptures show us that the truths behind God's divine arithmetic, if you will, that adds change, transforming our lives into eternal kingdom lives. I'm going to explain this to you about this game plan, about, about how a formula. You know, in school, uh, going back to the VBS stuff, in school, you, uh, children, you, you're taught by uh, an arithmetic formula, a mathematical formula. And God here, if you, if you will, especially for the children, you'll look at this scripture that we're going to read here, and it's pretty much an arithmetic formula for success in life, for godliness in life, for a good life, as it says here in scripture. You see, through His, God's righteousness revealed in Jesus Christ, God gives His people a faith that brings grace and peace to life. God's game plan, this formula. Let's read this in Scripture. Second Peter, the first chapter, I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible uh, this morning. Verse 1 says this, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle, and an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have received a faith equal to ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, Simon Peter is writing a letter here to the believers and that have both been following God and, and then also those that may have fallen away from their faith. 
He's, he's writing to them and he's challenging them to, to grow in their faith, not simply just be satisfied with who they are. Hopefully, whenever you take a look at when we were going through the Not a Fan series for the last six weeks, Brother Sid did uh, the seventh week last week on that. The, when we take a look at this and being a, a follower, a committed follower of Jesus Christ, not just a fan of Jesus Christ, we understood that, that what it meant to actually be on board with that and about how God changes your life for certain purposes. And that is to be used by Him. That is to be able to grow with Him. Whenever we take a look at the Scripture here, in point blank, whenever He identifies Himself, Simon Peter, a, ser a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, we're going to break that down. Now, Simon Peter identifies Himself. Unlike the opening in 1 Peter, where he identifies Himself simply as Peter, here, Peter chooses to introduce Himself by His full name, Simon Peter. You see, in doing so, he just suggested here that the transformation that had occurred in his own life. Simon was his old name before he came, became a follower of Jesus Christ. Peter was a new name that was given to him in Matthew, the 16th chapter, verse 18, by Jesus Christ. Whenever he identifies himself as Simon Peter, this new Peter, he's identifying the transformation, the change that has taken place in his life here in verse 1. He called himself a servant, an apostle. Servant, the Greek word is, is doulos. In Greek, and this is what it means. It means slave. Simon Peter is identifying himself as a slave to Jesus Christ. A servant to Jesus Christ. The second part here is an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle is something that, that is to go out and to spread the gospel. We talked earlier about, about having uh, the apostles is being able to, to go through and to, uh, to be able to, to go out and do things, to serve, to spread the gospel. A disciple learns. The apostle part is going out and doing Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ here, Paul is desires, desires to submit to God, to obey his teachings, and to be sent out to spread the gospel message. If you think about it, how beautiful that is. You and I should be able to inject our names there, to have that desire to submit to God, to obey his teachings, and to be sent out to spread God's message. The second part here of the first verse says here in Scripture, to those who have received a faith equal to ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Messiah of faith. He is the Messiah who has made us acceptable to God by faith. The faith of Jesus Christ is received. It's not earned. No person deserves it. No person deserves the faith of Jesus Christ. No person can earn it. Nobody can to go out and work enough for it. It's a free gift. Amen. The free gift that is given to every person who believes in Jesus Christ. So, in Scripture here, Simon Peter, a servant, an apostle, He's talking about to those who have received uh, the faith equal to ours and were equal to the righteousness of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's talk about this righteousness. Let's talk about righteousness and what this means actually in Scripture when we take a look at this. You see, righteousness frequently refers to the righteous act of God in Christ, which brings salvation to us through the cross, and identifies us as righteous in his sight because of Christ's death. 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 21, says this. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When you read this in Scripture, ladies and gentlemen, we have, when it says, it says that we have received a faith equal to ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, what this means is when we're talking about here, this hour, 
Why are we righteous? We are only righteous because of what Christ has done for us. Amen. That's it. You and I are not righteous upon our own. We're inherently uh, sinful on our own. However, due to what Christ has done for us, through the, the righteousness here, we, we share in that. How do you share in it? How would you share in something that you didn't earn in the very beginning? Now that trips people up a lot of times. Especially when we're looking at this in Scripture and you're going, you're sharing and who you're sharing with. Look closely here. You're sharing this of what the apostles have. So hold on a minute. Wait a minute here. Hold the press. So you're saying here, Brother Jimmy, that, that we are sharing in the love of God? We are sharing in the very things that the apostles shared in? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. That you and I are just as loved as the apostles were when they followed Jesus. You and I have the exact same God living inside of us that the apostles were going out and spreading the gospel on behalf of. That's exactly what took place. That's who it is. That's what's going on. Simon Peter is using God's righteousness here as a ethical term, referring to the fairness or justice of God. The righteousness or fairness of God, get this, refuses to make distinctions among those who received His grace. God does not play favorites with His grace. Everyone is given the same opportunity of grace through Jesus Christ. Everyone. I must not have said that loud enough or something got lost in the translation because I didn't hear any feedback. So I'm going to say that again. All right? This is we take two for you guys. This is the part where you guys say amen a little bit. All right? The righteousness, the fairness of God refuses to make distinctions amongst those who receive God's grace. God does not play favorites with His grace. Amen. Everyone is given the same opportunity to have the same grace found through Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, that's a better response. <laughs> you see, when you think about this, the same grace that was given to the apostles, the same grace that was given to the woman at the well, the same grace that was given to to all those throughout Scripture is the same grace that's given to you and I today. What a blessing that is. That's something we can't take for granted. That's something that we, we, we need to understand and apply it even to us today. That same grace is given to us freely. Second Peter, the first chapter, verse 2 says this, May grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, the knowledge here, it's not an academic or theoretical knowledge. It is a personal knowledge. There's a difference there. A theoretical or academic knowledge is a head knowledge, one that, that, that has a, a mental cap capacity to be able to understand something, that's a heck of a lot different than having a personal knowledge. It's a knowledge that grows because a person begins to know somebody fully and understand someone's heart. As we grow in personal knowledge of God and Christ, as we experience God and God the Father's unconditional acceptance through Christ, transformation in our lives begin. We begin to experience grace and peace. And what it says here in Scripture, we should multiply that. Multiply that not only in our relationships with God, but our, in our relationships with each other. That's intense. If you look at that Scripture, if you break that down, and that's pretty in-depth right there in the second verse, that when you multiply, you're multiplying your love, your knowledge, your intimacy with God and that continues to grow and as your love in Christ grows 
your love for your fellow human beings should grow as well. Now sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes boys spiritually, we're, we're growing spiritually and we're loving, we're loving God more and more and more. And then sometimes we're not loving our neighbors more and more and more. Especially today in our divisive culture that we live in. We seem to be throwing darts at people more and more and more and more. Listen to me here clear, carefully, ladies and gentlemen. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you, you can't have it one way or the other. If you really, truly love God and you're following and desiring to love God more, then you're going to love people more as well. Amen. It goes hand in hand. You can't make a distinction from one to another. Jesus Christ didn't. If Jesus Christ didn't, how in the world can you and I have the license to go out and judge who we're going to love more and who's not. Who is God going to love more and who God loves less. We don't have the license to do that. We don't ever want to get caught up in that as well. You see, ladies and gentlemen, God's power enables us to make every effort to add transforming characteristics to our lives, which in turn is, leads us to enable to be effective and productive lives and live perfect lives for Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1.3 gets to our VBS over there. VBS verse is on the wall over there. It's going to be up on the screen as well. The kids are going to memorize this this week. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. This is packaged pretty tightly. And we're going to unpackage this as we go step by step here you see his divine power has given us everything required for life understand that in scripture and his guide and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness jesus christ is the messiah of life and godliness so what does it mean by life and godliness well that's what it means this is scientific ready all right, I'm going to use big words here, and I'm going to try to impress you with Greek and Hebrew and everything else. Ready? It means God's done everything for you. Amen. Amen. All right? That's the Bethel way of understanding that. That's my way of understanding that. When you look at this, and we could go through and understand all the lexicons and everything else, but what it's telling us in Scripture is God's done it all. God's done it all. He's taken care of you. He has done everything that He needs to do. When you read here in Scripture, His divine power has given us everything. Everything means what? Everything means everything. Yeah. God has given you everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. Now, first, life. What is life? Life is energy. It's force. It's, it's power of being. And the life which Jesus Christ gives is life. It's energy, it's force, it's power. The life given by Christ is the, the, the very opposite of perishing. It's a deliverance from condemnation and death. It is the stopping or cessation of aging, deterioration, decay and corruption. You know what it is, ladies and gentlemen? The life given by Christ is a life eternal. Amen. A life that lasts forever and ever. John 17, 3 says this. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. The life given by Christ is an abundant life. A life to the very highest quality. A life that overflows with all the good things of life. Love, joy, peace, peace. Goodness, satisfaction, and security. This is a life given to us by God. And before you go, oh, don't get naming and claiming on me, Brother Jimmy. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about living a godly life. You see here in Scripture, I'm not about naming and claiming. I'm talking about living the life that God has given to you. So many people, I think, that, that, that they think that, that God has given them a life of, of a spirit of not happiness or not joy. And they're always downtrodden and everything's wrong with them and everything's negative, 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 negative. I don't believe like that. I believe that we should walk around up high and not, and I'm not saying that we don't, we're not concerned sometimes because we are. But let's quit walking around. God's given you everything you need to do in life. So walk around with joy. Amen. 
you got you should have joy in your life because because your retirement is out of this world. Amen. It's divine. And so no need to walk around, well, you know, all the time. You know, I'm talking about sometimes, yes, we do get, you know, antsy, nervous. Sometimes all these things happen. That's life in which we have. But let's quit walking around in that constantly. You know, you know, as guys know, I did a sermon a couple of uh, 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 years back about um, having a house in Warrenville. Remember you guys, some of you guys remember that? But... Uh, we should walk around joyous. We should walk around victorious. God's given us peace. God's given us goodness. God's given us all. Amen. You see, second point to this, the third verse here, is godliness is living like Jesus Christ and being a godly person. Back in the second I mean, the third verse here, when you read that, that, that the, His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who has called us by His own glory and goodness. As we continue to unpackage this, godliness is living like Jesus Christ. It's living a life like it should be. It's living a life that God intended it to be. God gave man life, therefore God knows what life should be. Above all things, life should be godly, just like God. The world, the, the, the word godliness in Greek is asubian. It means to live in the reverence and awe of God. Let that sink in for a little while. The word here for godliness means to, to live in reverence and awe of God. We should all be so, so, so conscious of God's presence that we live as God would, would be living right there, right by talking beside us. But I want you to, to go a little further than that. Think about this. This is intense now. If the Holy Spirit lives inside of you as a believer of Jesus Christ, then the Holy Spirit is walking in your shoes. That's intense. So where are you taking Jesus? Where are you taking God? What are you doing with God and Jesus? That's intense. That's the truth. Amen. The same power that lived in the apostles of yesterday, the same power of the Holy Spirit that was in Christ Jesus is given to us by God to live inside of us. So here, when it says in Scripture here that, that, that we are to require a life of, of a good life, a, a godliness, this godliness, ladies and gentlemen, means us to live like a Christian. I don't want to sugarcoat that. That's what it is. Live like a Christian. Live upon the earth as Christ lived. It's described to an attitude of reverence in the presence of God who is the one who is majestic and divine. Godly life. What does that describe? It describes our obedience. There's no other way around that. The godly life describes our obedience. Our day-to-day -day life. Let's look a little bit deeper into this. Look how we receive life and, and godliness here. Whenever we take a look here in, in Scripture, when you look a little deeper, how do you receive life? How do you receive godliness? Well, it is by the knowledge of Christ. When you look at that in Scripture, it's by the knowledge of Christ. And the knowledge not being a mental knowledge, but a heart knowledge. Have that intimacy, that intimate heart knowledge of Christ. We must know Christ personally. We must know Him as Savior and Lord. We must be willing to walk with Him and share Him with Him every day. Willing to know that, that we are living a godly life and actually experiencing life as God intended it to be. God intended Adam and Eve to walk with Him every day. And Adam and Eve did walk with God every day. And then the sin caused the separation. Jesus Christ came to get rid of the separation. Jesus Christ came to fulfill the Old Testament law to get rid of the separation and therefore Christ Jesus made 
everything, the gift by grace, in which you and I have the God, the Father, inside of us through the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's a praise. That's huge. Think about that for a moment. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you after you receive Christ, so God is actually walking in your shoes. <coughs> That's deep. In Scripture, when it says, who called us by His glory and His goodness, note in the Scripture that, that Christ has called us to glory and goodness. He has called us to a life of glory and moral excellence. Some scriptures say virtue. We are to live pure and righteous lives, virtuous lives, glorious lives. The same one who calls us, who invites us by grace to be a part of his kingdom, also enables, enables us to, to change and to grow spiritually. This is the destination toward which the transformation will take place as a true committed follower of Christ. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the more we come to know Jesus Christ in a personal way, the more we begin to understand who Christ really is and what He has done for us. And as we grow in this kind of understanding, we can appreciate His divine power that assists us in growing spiritually. It's a step-by-step -step process. It's that game plan. God has given you a game plan, and that is accept my son, Jesus Christ, as your Savior. Next, walk around like a child of God. If you're a child of God, act like a child of God. Walk around in a, in a godly manner in a right, by do that by living a good, righteous, virtuous life. Amen. Walk the life that God has given you. That's it. That's the game plan. God's giving you the game plan. Now it's game on. It's game on. What are we going to do? It's game on. Are you going to walk out the game plan like God wants you to do? That's exactly what we have. Game on. That's what VBS is all about this year. It's game on. Let's walk out God's perfect plan for us. This morning as we stand. Gear up, get ready, and game on. As Patsy begins to play, I just want you to pray and ask God what it is that He needs to speak to you about this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, you might be here this morning and you never really heard the game plan. In other words, you, you never accepted Jesus. You been walking around and you haven't really been walking with God. You can change that today. You can start this very day to walk with God. Some maybe have been walking with God sometimes and then you kind of just kind of gotten away. Well, today, let that be the day that you get back on track with God. Some of you may, may need to call Bethel Baptist Church home and join us here in fellowship as a member here. Some may need to come down the altar and pray. But ladies and gentlemen, God is saying game on. How are you going to respond? How do you respond is between you and God. It's not between you and your neighbor, you and your, your, your husband, you and your wife, you and your children, you and your grandparents. It's between you and God. God's saying game on. What are you going to do? How are you going to respond? Walking out godly life is how God wants us to do. That can only happen if you have Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. This morning as God speaks, you be obedient. You come as we sing.